if you could just call him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Dima, what uh, you you in command position? So, shall I yes. share the screen now? Um, well, let, let me first introduce you. Um, just a formal thing. Uh, so, welcome everybody to to the seminar of the International Institute of Physics, and uh, I am happy to see many faces uh, from Brazil and also from elsewhere in the world. Uh, today we have a talk by Paul Bigman. Paul received his PhD from the Landau Institute, and since 1991, he is a professor at the uh, University of Chicago, where he is now uh, Robert Benneker, uh, Distinguished Service Professor. So Paul, um, as I read in Wikipedia, Paul is specialized in theoretical condensed matter, but Paul really talks to both uh, theoretical condensed matter people and high energy, theoretical high energy people, He's, he's very well known for solutions of several fundamental problems in physics, including uh, quantum model uh, together with Alexei Tzvelik and, and also Anderson impurity model. Uh, he is also known for solutions to Vesemin Witten model and O3 nonlinear sigma model. So for his achievements, he received many uh, honors, including he was elected a fellow of American Physical Society. He, he was, um, uh, he received uh, Larson Sager Prize in, my, in one of the most recent ones. And Paul likes, uh, like, luckily he likes ocean and good weather. So he's a frequent visitor to, to Natal, to the Institute of Natal, where he now is uh, one of the members of the advisory committee. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Dima, I have to add, uh, I'm mostly like the company. So mm, tropics are secondary, but uh, people are primary. Very good, and today Paul is uh, again with us uh, virtually, and he will talk about uh, off-starter problem. Uh, before I pass the word to Paul, I ask everybody to keep uh, the micro microphones muted. And uh, since we are many people, uh, ask the questions, keep the question until the end of the talk. And in the end of the talk, please use our chat to sign in for us to observe the order of questions. So Paul, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's fantastic to be, uh, <clears throat> although virtually to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I feel myself, uh, I just feel the wind from the ocean. Anyway, uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, humbled to see so many people and uh, uh, in, in participants and um, uh, so many friends. It's, it's a great experience. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, permission to override the chairman and uh, um, um, invite uh, uh, questions uh, during the talk. Uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it will be okay. <clears throat> Just a moment, I would correct. Uh, the position. So now I uh, I uh, open the file. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I have to first uh, share the screen. Open the file. <clears throat> yeah, Dima, is this okay now? Yes, we can see the slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, uh, I uh, select this topic. Uh, integral. <clears throat> the story is about uh, Hofstadter butterfly. Probably everybody heard about what it is about and uh, I will explain um, again. I selected this topic because it's not my it's uh, based on my work, but it's not a recent works. I usually talk about my recent works, but not in this case. Uh, mostly, a reason for that is mostly um, sentimental. Uh, first of all, I like this problem to begin with. Uh, I um, feel that the problem 
is uh, almost solved, but not quite, and it's waited, waiting to be solved. Uh, but most importantly is the problem, his work on this problem on mathematical side has been awarded um, uh, Fields Medal recently and Heinemann Prize recently to uh, Heinemann Prize to Svetlana Zetomirska and um, uh, she's a mathematician and uh, uh, Fields Medal to uh, Avila, uh, who is Brazilian and uh, it's probably the first uh, Brazilian Fields Medal as far as I know. Um, and I thought uh, talking about the subject to physics audience, not to mathematical audience, um, on this occasion makes sense, especially in this seminar. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the problem comes in uh, several different incarnations. I will uh, discuss slowly both, uh, all, um, a few of them. And uh, the magic uh, attraction of the problem is that it's simplicity, uh, simplicity of uh, formulation. It's formulated right in one box right here. Uh, uh, and um, as always happened with uh, good problems, a simplicity of uh, formulation right in one box brings uh, incredible complexity uh, and uh, subtleties uh, of, the of the solution. So <clears throat> the problem is formulated as following. Um, and this is how mathematicians view the problem. So what is written here is a difference equation. Uh, you can think about uh, this as a Schrodinger equation of a particle uh, jumping along one dimensional line, hopping in one dimensional line. N is, N is a coordinate. Oh, sorry. N is a coordinate and uh, it's uh, just hopping from to the left and to the right, but existing potential, uh, periodic potential, Uh, yes, periodic potential, uh, which is um, cosine, lambda is a coefficient, important coefficient. The period of this potential I called, uh, I label by phi, it's inverse period. And uh, K is a parameter, phase. So what we want to know is the spectrum of, um, to find the spectrum of this problem. Uh, we function also of some interest, but uh, less, uh, but uh, the spectrum is a major problem. So very simple. Story. If um, uh, uh, that uh, hoping will be replaced by, if the letters will be replaced by uh, continuum, uh, this operator becomes Laplacian, and uh, then it will be Schrodinger equation for particle in uh, periodic potential. That equation in mathematics is called Mathieu equation. Um, because it's discrete. It's called almost Mathieu equation in mathematics, but in physics it's also labeled, known as the Harper equation or Hofstadter problem, and there is another dozen names. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so that's it. Uh, we want to solve this equation as far as we can and find the spectrum. Uh, apparently it's one of the most celebrated uh, problem in spectral theory. Uh, it's a mathematical discipline. And in physics, uh, it has enormous application for, say, starting from localization, um, understand localization, quasi crystal, chaos. Uh, it can be formulated as a dynamical system for Higgs rotator. Uh, my interest in it uh, comes from quantum Hall effect, uh, which is. Uh, closely related, I will discuss about this. Mm, but a number of applications may uh, continue, uh, may occupy the entire page. Um, okay, 
there are several attempts to implement uh, that uh, problem experimentally in um, organic conductors, uh, magnetic chains, and uh, recently in uh, cold atomic physics. Uh, with uh, limited success, I would say. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, here's a list of uh, incomplete list of uh, works on the problem. Um, I separated them between um, before 1990s, and it's mostly physicists um, and have, uh, Zach Asbir, Hofstadter, Vanier, Abri Andrea, Avron, uh, and uh, Taulis, uh, and some mathematicians, Billison. Research and assignments. And after nine, nine so mathematicians, um, um, it's uh, notable, notable work by Hatsugai uh, Kamoto and um, the physicist and Zhitomirska, uh, last mathematicians, and Avila, finally. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, the problem is very sensitive to the value of uh, uh, the period of the cosine. So there are two, two scales, two, two periods. One is the lattice scale, it's one. So I label this by one. And the second is the period of um, external potential, phi. Uh, they can be commensurate and incommensurate and physics changed, okay? So it's a problem of um, moving a particle um, in incommensurate potential. If, uh, the, if the period of the potential is incommensurate with the lattice set. Okay. Uh, we will select, uh, we will distinguish two cases. One is when the period is rational, um, this Phi, I, call, I will call it flux for a reason we will see it, is rational. Uh, means ratio, ratio of two mm, mutually prime integers. Then this equation is merely matrix Q by Q, uh, right? And the period, so we can solve it so with periodic boundary condition uh, and uh, denominator tells you the, the size of the, of the space. Um, so it becomes a matrix, Q by Q matrix. Uh, computer can diagonalize it uh, easily. Uh, and uh, many people did it. Uh, not many people draw the spectrum in a graphic, and that was Hofstadter. It is his PhD work in Regensburg in Germany. Uh, he sort of um, created the first example of uh, so-called computer graphics. That's one of the most uh, famous uh, and early examples of, of what is now called computer graphics, 1976. So what you see here, what is drawn here is the spectrum. Uh, the energy is on a vertical line. And the flux, this period, is on the horizontal line. Okay. Uh, so blue part, uh, allowed part of the spectrum bends. And the white part are gaps, uh, not part which not allowed uh, for, uh, for the spectrum. So you can see that if, um, for example, flux is pi and it's commensurate case uh, with ratio between periods is two, we see the two bands, one and it's merged to another band. The spectrum is symmetric for positive energy, negative energy, it's symmetric. So the two bands, they merge. If the spectrum is one third, uh, if, if flux is one third, it's commensurability three, we see three bands. This is one band. It's uh, another half band which have merged. 
and uh, one more band. So the number of bands, band, because it's Q by Q metric, the number of bands depends not on flux, okay, but on denominator. For example, if you take uh, flux one third and slightly change denominator, the spectrum will be entirely different. It blows up. It's now will consist of uh, three times uh, 137 plus one bands instead of three bands uh, before making this addition. So it's a problem about arithmetics and uh, of the flux and uh, commensurability. So by this picture, on this picture, you see that uh, a small change of the flux. So if we move uh, from this point to this point, create incredibly incredible change of uh, the spectrum. <clears throat> Hofstadter himself saw this as a, when I saw it first, I thought, yes, it's a resemble butterfly, but he himself saw it as a infinitely many butterflies escaping, uh, flying toward infinity. That's uh, by his own words. Oh, now, if we uh, briefly break this talk and uh, go to the web, uh, sorry, and uh, I write, uh, um, I write, uh, uh, oh, I write Hofstadter butterfly. It's not good, but I hope Google will understand me. The wiki, that's for this efficient. My connection is not good. Maybe it's not a good idea. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then we see that uh, incredible collection of images of Hofstadter butterfly in all possible incarnations. And, uh, it's really a computer graphic uh, business. Uh, you can see it as many somewhere. Hofstadter himself will appear at some point, I guess, uh, maybe later. Uh, and uh, it's all about uh, that is that spectrum. Where is Hofstadter himself? Ah, yes, that's him. Uh, yeah, that is uh, him. But he was a PhD student at the time. Okay, so I switch back to uh, to the to the talk. <clears throat> and um, as I said, um, I'll be highly appreciate uh, questions, uh, not in the end, but uh, during the talk. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so the question is, what, uh, so it's obvious that the spectrum has some uh, beauty. That's uh, clear. Uh, but it's also have some structure and uh, it's a hierarchical structure. You can see that it's a kind of a butterfly inside the butterfly and uh, it's, all, it's fractal by the way. And uh, it has some um, intriguing structure in it. And uh, that's what um, brings interest to the problem and how to uncover what is inside. Okay. Uh, there are, okay, uh, the problem can be formulated in, uh, okay, the, on this slide I will review what happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a moment, I, I think something happened. I have to share the screen again.
Yes. Okay. Uh, on this slide, I collect uh, some elementary knowledge of uh, basic knowledge of the spectrum. And the uh, work of mathematicians is in uh, spectral theory is not to find the beauty, the structure of the spectrum, but to proving, to prove uh, the three points which are listed here. So I repeat them. Uh, so uh, let me emphasize that uh, uh, there are two, para two major parameters, uh, the, the period and uh, the coefficient in front of cosine. Okay. So if this coefficient is large, so the potential is large, <clears throat> the problem is, oops, sorry, it's a mistake. Uh, there is a mistake here. Uh, Dima, is what, what's going on? Uh, for some reason, my screen stopped sharing. No, I, I don't know. So I think, uh... Wasn't you that stopped sharing the screen? No, it's not me. It's not me, definitely. Uh, let me try to share again. Maybe I stopped to use a pencil. Uh, OK. Uh, I'm afraid to use a pencil now. So the first, uh, so uh, if lambda is large, so coefficient in front of cosine is large, uh, and phi is irrational, it's an infinitely dimensional matrix, and therefore it's expected to be infinitely many bands and infinitely many gaps. But it so happens that if light, if uh, lambda is more than one, then all gaps are all bands, all bands. So bands collapse to, a po to points, two points. It's infinitely many points and they are isolated from each other. Uh, such spectrum is called uh, um, infinite pure point set. And from physics point of view, the problem uh, well, it becomes an insulator. All bands reduce to a point. That's a major model for Anderson localization. Incommensurate potential creates, uh, destroy uh, band spectrum and, uh, and uh, brings up, give, give rise to Anderson localization. All the functions are uh, localized. Now, in the opposite regime, when lambda is less than one weak coupling, uh, the spectrum, just the opposite, it consists of infinitely many bands, but they are bands. They are tiny, tiny, they are, their size is zero, but they are still bands. Uh, they have a um, continuum density of states, and that's kind of spectrum called absolutely continuum. Many years ago, Taurus, uh, David Taurus, prove a formula that total bandwidth is the difference between lambda and one. That's a total bandwidth. When lambda goes to zero, then total bandwidth come to zero. And in this remarkable case, and this is a case of most of, of my interest and uh, everybody's interest, sometimes it's called critical case and lambda equal to one, the spectrum becomes a peculiar counter set, a counter type set, which is called singular continuum. It's the set without isolated points, but with zero measure. Um, it's neither metal nor insulator. It's happened in this case. So bands collapse to zero, gaps collapse to zero, the total measure of the bands is zero, but these points are not isolated, not isolated. So it's not insulator, not metal, uh, but uh, something else. And that's what we would be interested in. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
uh, so I spent almost half of uh, the time, but uh, I didn't even start. But the idea of the talk, uh, the idea of the talk, it's a nutshell, is uh, consists of two points, and I'm not sure that I will be able to cover it. Is one is despite of complexity of the spectrum, it's one of the most uh, remarkable and unmanageable kind of unhuman counter type, counter -type sets. But despite of it, the problem obviously possesses some interesting structure. It's not completely chaotic, it's very structural, complicated, but structural. And in fact, we have found uh, some times ago that this almost Massey equation is actually integrable. Integrable as much as uh, Heisenberg chain is integrable and actually belong to the same class, can be solved by better than that equation. Professor Popel? Yes. Uh, do you allow me a quick question? You told about the critical case, and I was asking myself if that's a counter set, uh, how can we identify the, the dimension of this counter set? Yes, is this is a good, log two, log three? Yes, yes, yes. This is what I'm going to talk about. Just give yeah. me a second. Thank you very much for the question, but give me a second. But now I would like to, to before I coming to that, I would like to emphasize the following, that this almost Mathieu equation, this equation is actually related, closely related to so-called cyclic representation of quantum group. This is a quantum, it's a deformation of SL2. And solving this spectrum, we actually, trying to find representation of, uh, it's called cyclic representation of uh, this quantum group and uh, determine its highest weight. Uh, let me recall what highest weight is. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happens. Sorry, I have to do it all over again. Uh, yes, uh, let me re recall what is high set. Um, for example, if you take SU2 um, Lie group uh, or SO3, the isomorphic, then uh, um, representation is characterized by spins and spins goes from minus S to plus S. And this S, th those labels are called weights. Weights. Okay, so what we're doing here is, and this is what I would like to, it's a remarkable thing, what we're doing here to finding the spectrum is we computing a, a, a weights, but a little bit more complicated group. It's sort of spins. Every point here is a spin, but um, of uh, what is called uh, quantum deformed uh, SL, quantum group or deformed SL2. Uh, it's not, it sounds a little bit uh, complicated and, speci and specialized, but it's as simple as possible. And I try to make it clear in the next uh, couple of slides. Okay, the second issue is the second issue, whether we can use uh, this information, uh, this relation to representation theory to um, understand uh, fractal dimensions of this, a complicated set, as somebody asked me. And uh, that's described by hierarchical tree. That's uh, in, in the scaling hypothesis, which I formulate on the next slide. Okay, so I start from the hierarchical tree and how shall we treat this spectrum? What do we want? From it? Okay, so first of all, we want this flux to be, to be uh, irrational. Okay. Uh, well, uh, too many irrational points. Uh, well, if it's irrational points, the spectrum consists of infinitely many points. How shall we characterize these points? 
Okay, so the standard way is to find the proper sequence of rational number which converges to irrational number uh, with the proper convergence. And there are many sequences like that. It's called Faraday sequences. Uh, but I will talk about very specific one. And uh, approach uh, this irrational number through rational numbers. But in every rational numbers, I know the story. It's uh, diagonalization of the matrix. Of the matrix, I have Q bands, but this Q is growing. Okay. Now, and now the problem is to describe the spectrum is the following. Uh, we fixed, uh, take a irrational number, take a rational number phi. Then we have many, many points. I can't, I, I afraid even to draw them. The, it's a, the more complicated that uh, rational points, more complicated than irrational points, some complicated sets. But to every point, maybe there is a path along this sequence, starting from one half, then one third, maybe there is a path which eventually leads to this. This path is called hierarchical tree. And the tree is chosen such that if I look for bands for every step, every point on the tree and see how they collapse to zero, I will discover that they collapse to, to zero as a power of denominator, but different by two by some number, which is called anomalous dimension or fractal dimension. And uh, along this tree, every tree, I will have its own fractal dimension. Once I, while I, if I find them, that will be full characterization of the spectrum. So characterization of the spectrum, of this kind of spectrum consists of two pieces. One is topology to determine the tree and the, the sequence. So the kind of a guide inside of this Hofstadter butterfly to some irrational number. Second is to determine the scaling dimension. That what I told you does not belong to mathematics. Neither of this is, has been proved. Existence of three, three is a hypothesis which belongs to us and existence of uh, dimensions also hypothesis to belong to us but i think there is a common consensus that it's all true uh, tree could be very complicated and uh, for example for this irrational number which can be written as a continuum fraction very simple continuum fraction one three uh, plus uh, one, three, and so on. Uh, here's an example of this tree. It's uh, not absolutely not trivial, uh, but can be determined. And this has been determined. Along each branch, there is a, its own fractional, its own critical dimension. That has not been determined. Only few of them are known, but they are infinitely many. And uh, the goal of the problem in my view, in my view, in my eyes is to determine all this uh, content of the spectral dimensions. Okay, on that slide, on that slide is a hierarchical tree for Fibonacci, for golden mean, for square root, for square, for square root of five minus one two. Uh, that is a fraction one plus one one plus one, so the simplest one. So this tree is completely determined. It's very relatively simple, but not trivial as you can see. And what is now currently known that is uh, two uh, fractal dimension. One is along the upper uppermost uh, tree, uppermost branch, and this one, and another one is along the middle, middle branch. All others has not been computed. At that time, uh, we didn't have enough computer power and uh, it's still unknown even for this case. But three has been determined. Pasha, can I have a question, Pasha? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, this, how how this solution known something? Ah, By that's what I'm going to discuss in remaining uh, uh, time. Okay. Thank you. I'm just uh, jumping ahead. 
to tell you what we are going toward to. And then now I start to discuss some steps to obtain it. Okay. So, can I ask, can I make a question too? Sure. sure, sure. Uh, what is the, the reason for the change of, of, of the sign of the epsilon? Ah, they uh, fluctuate widely. We don't, I don't know. I can have no comment. Right. Some positive, some negative, and uh, depends on the on the branch. And the uh, uh, structure of the spectrum is completely unknown. What we do know, but mathematicians do not, that this tree exists and spectrum exists. But what it is, uh, what its structure, I don't know. Nobody knows. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Now, uh, in order to formulate uh, the, okay, in order to proceed, I have to reformulate this problem in a different way. And it's the following. Uh, let's assume, oh, you know what? Sorry, once again. Okay, this is a reformulation of the problem. Let's assume, let's consider two dimensional square lattice and the electrons with jumping from one side to another, up, down, down, up, down, left, right. And this is called block electrons. And they're sitting in magnetic field. Magnetic field flux through plaquette is phi. Let me reformulate it, um, this problem. So it's one electron, so it's a Schrodinger equation. So T uh, hopping, uh, hopping uh, amplitude from point N to point M from here to here, for example. Uh, psi is a wave function sitting on site M and, and E is the spectrum. Okay, so let's assume that uh, all hopping uh, are one. So it is uh, lattice, uh, isotropic lattice, square lattice. And imposing of magnetic field, magnetic flux, through the lattice up means that if I take all these hopping amplitudes and uh, multiply it along plaquette, I will get the flux. So later on, I will call it Q square, this parameter. That's a flux. That's a formulation, it's, that's called uh, block electrons in magnetic field or literally Hofstadter problem. Hofstadter solved the work on this problem. Okay. So, the problem could be formulated through the group of magnetic translation. So translation um, by the vector N on a lattice and translation by the vector M on a lattice, it's operators. They not commute, but, okay, sorry. So it's uh, start to impossible to use. Okay, those translations do not commute, but commute uh, by the flux. In terms of this algebra, it's called the algebra of magnetic translation, or group of magnetic translations. The Hamiltonian will be simply translation by one step toward uh, the direction X, translation to the same backward, uh, translation up, translation down. Okay. Now, if we choose Landau gauge, and our gauge, that means uh, choosing representation of these translations. One of the shifts and another is uh, multiplication. That problem, two dimensional problem, electrons in two dimensional electrons in magnetic field will be reduced to one dimensional problem, which is exactly this almost Mathieu equation, right? So uh, that is uh, hoping from along uh, X direction and uh, this cosine is a hopping along Y direction. So cosine is has two parts and uh, that's uh, hopping. So this problem are identical. Choose another gauge, get different equation, same spectrum. And uh, that's uh, actually what the story is about. It's not about this equation. It's about Bloch electron in magnetic field and magnetic field is uh, 
uh, could be rational or irrational. Okay. Okay. So I will, um, no time, so I will skip many slides, but uh, come to a point. So I will formulate the result, some algebraic result, and then I say a few words how it has been obtained. Okay. I'm okay. So no explanation from here to here, but result. So this is the equation I want to solve. Notation, uh, Q is uh, e to the flux, magnetic flux, flux is ratio of two numbers. Then I say, that's a claim, that solution, that energies spectrum is given by, is given by the sum of some complex numbers. This is real, of course, but these numbers are complex. The number of these numbers is Q denominator. And these numbers are solutions of the so-called beta and that's equation. It's written in the box. So this equation is uh, pretty complicated, Al algebraic equations, has many solutions. We solve it, find the solutions, find Q numbers, sum them up, give element of the spectrum. Find another solution, Q numbers, sum them up, give another point of the spectrum and so on. They call the beta and equation, they very reminiscent to X, Y, X, X, uh, Z, uh, Heisenberg chain. Uh, and uh, next slide, uh, I have, uh, now I have two, two issues. First of all, I, I would like to explain you how to come from here to here. But second is whether this is better formulation of this problem. Maybe it's more, even more complicated than the original problem. And apparently it's not. That's not clear what to do with. This equation are structured and, and uh, Hofstadter butterfly structure this hierarchical structure that it's butterfly flying another butterfly and so on is absolutely obvious from this equation. Remarkably simplified story, although equations look ugly, a more complicated. And from here, I can say nothing. Okay, so I would like to, okay, so two things. First of all, how I can derive this equation, why it's possible to derive them, then how to solve them, and from the solution to determine the tree. Those equations must also determine the fractional dimensions, but this has not been done. Uh, I think that entirely technical reasons and it should be done, but um, equations are very clever and they know about dimensions. We are not clever enough. Uh, to solve them. Okay, now a uh, few words about wave function. Um, uh, let's consider a polynomial whose roots are solution of this equation. It's a polynomial. And then uh, wave function of this almost material equation will be value of this polynomial on points on a circle with some funny coefficients, uh, which are written here, which are called uh, quantum dialogarithms. I don't want to focus on this. Just would like to see, to say, to demonstrate that it's all very specific, very practical and concrete. We want to solve this equation. We want energy, we want psi function, uh, vectors, uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Solve this equation, obtain energy, obtained uh, the wave function. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and this is what I said. So this is a question I would like to solve. I would like to solve them uh, in this limit when uh, I approach to original number and uh, describe the structure. Okay. Now, uh, now how it has been solved? Um, now I will demonstrate it as a miracle, and then I explain the reason. Um, as I said, uh, it's better to think about the problem as uh, particles 
applying conolith, jump hoping conolith is in magnetic field. And uh, that's uh, the Newtonian operator, which I would like to diagonalize. And I can choose a gauge. In this gauge, it's this equation. But I can choose different gauge. Whatever gauge I can choose, does matter. Spectrum is the same. Uh, but equation looks differently. Uh, this is a uh, so-called chiral gauge. I will not specify, it's specified here, but I will not uh, kind of specify it. Now equation has a little bit different form, but the same spectrum. And uh, now it has three terms, one, two, three. Contrary to original one, which has four terms, one, two, and here's three, cosine is two terms. Okay, just a different gauge, but very specifically chosen, okay. Okay, now it's a different equation, but I can think about as a, mm, it's a discrete equation, but I can think about as a different equation of this form. And if I put Z on a, as a Q to the N on a circle, it becomes uh, equivalent equation. Now the gauge chosen such that solutions of these equations are polynomial. That's a major point. Why this gauge exists? Not clear. Because it, so eventually we're talking of some kind of um, orthogonal polynomials. In this gauge, which is most popular, it's absolutely not clear. The polynomial structure is not clear, but there is a gauge where solution is polynomial. Once they're polynomial, I know solutions of, I know equations for the roots of this polynomial and they're here. There is a one small step from here to here. I will not focus on it, but the major thing is that solutions are polynomial. It's a miracle. It could be or could may not be, but everybody who, you know, who, uh, work in physics knows that uh, once you see this picture it means that miracles happen. Uh, so it's a question of, and the way, and this is our personal history. We simply believe in miracles that uh, such pictures uh, cannot appear for nothing. And indeed, they basically solution of this problem in some in some gauge is polynomial, and once it's polynomial. Uh, there is a question for the roots. Now, now why is this miracle happened? Yes, and as I said, this equation basically capable to solve the problem. It has not been done in full scale, but part of the information like a topology of the spectrum has been extracted from these equations. Okay, now, uh, that's uh, my time allow me to explain only one sort of slide, uh, maybe two, and uh, keep uh, the rest uh, um, in, in, in dark. This is what I would like to explain. Uh, so I would, like to, I would like to explain a reason why this miracle happened, why there is some special gauge where solutions become polynomial. To do that, let me step back and recall you relation between orthogonal polynomial, for example, Hermit polynomial, Jacobi polynomial, classical polynomial to representation of the group SU2. So question is, let me formulate the question. Consider second order differential equation with some coefficients which are functional, some, some function, functions of the argument. And ask, find coefficients when solution of this equation are polynomials. And we know examples. I can specify this equation such that it will be a mid polynomial or special choice will be Jacobi polynomial or whatever. Why that happened? How to find all A, B, C when solutions are polynomial? And the trick is the following. Let's consider Euler top. S is an operator from SU2. 
spin operator from S U two. It's a operator, you know, standard spin operator from S U two, and form a bilinear combination of them. So it will be some operator. I call it Hamiltonian. And this is Euler top, but in some magnetic field. Okay. Then recall that finite dimensional representation of S U two spin could be represented by differential operators. And J is a spin of representation, right? So they are represented by, I think its formula has been, this representation known, known to probably to Heisenberg or maybe to <clears throat> participants of um, uh, French commune um, in, I don't know, to Legendre maybe, uh, there's, there's a whole history. So represent spins by simple differential operators substituted here, you will get some operator of that sort, but because the representation of SU2 chosen is finite dimensional with a given spin, I guarantee that this is actually not a differential operator, but a matrix. And matrix has finite number of solutions and they are in this language are polynomials. So all classical polynomials, which we know can be constructed and classified in this way. And this observation belonged to Alexander Turbiner in 88. Okay, now. I have a question. Is, so is this um, particular to SU2? I mean, here you, you've just chosen SU2. Could you take SU3 for- Yeah, for then you will get other more complicated polynomial. I think as they called uh, Gegenbauer polynomials, uh, those which related to SUN, it's a general concept. Okay, thank you. A general concept. So you take a representation of finite dimensional representation of uh, Lie group you like, um, represent them through differential operators, this representation is available, form either top, get second order differential equation, and before solving it, you already know that half of the solutions are polynomial. Okay, now, <clears throat> but question now is what to do, can we apply the same reasoning for different equation? And uh, that's the same three terms, different equation. And can, question is, can you find parameter Q is a shift? Can you find uh, all possible functions when solutions are polynomials? And the, right? So difference equation and uh, discrete equation, the same thing, you just choose Z on uh, in this position substitute. Okay, the answer to this question is also through representation theory, it's deformation of SU2, SO2, to so-called quantum version of SO2, um, which characterized by parameter Q, which is a step in this, this one, it's a step in, in the different equation. So uh, in SU2, I have um, algebra, I have generators, three spins, and I add also one, and this is the algebra. But uh, the deformation brings them to operators which traditionally called A, B, C, D, and uh, instead of this algebra, they are based so called quantum algebra, oh, quantum, like some, this is, they are very explicit. When is, does it come? It comes from solution of the Young-Baxter equation from a universal R matrix for Young-Baxter equation, A, B, C, D are elements of uh, R matrix. I will not, uh, I have no, neither desire, no time to talk about it, but this is a, this is called deformation of introduction of a parameter Q. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> then the question now is so, okay, doing that, doing that, doing that, I will find all discrete equations whose solutions are polynomial by the same reason. Now, now the question is is the Hofstadter problem? electrons on two-dimensional lattice in magnetic field, do they belong to 
to that set of uh, to that set of problem. To do that, we have to embed the um, group of magnetic translation into this SL quantum deformation of S of Q. And apparently it's possible. So the Hamiltonian, that's a relation between operators of magnetic translations and this A, B, C, D. And the Hamiltonian in a sense is uh, simply B plus C, they represent this part and this part, okay? Once it's done, if it's, it's a, this, is a, this is a miracle. So this problem is actually reduced to finding representation of uh, this algebra. Like uh, SU2, you will want to know that spin is quantized by one half and the representation of this algebra brings you instead of uh, quantization of spin by one half, a little bit more complicated picture, but in the same spirit. So every point here is analog of spin in this algebra. Okay. okay. Uh, so my time is over, but uh, it's a half of the talk. And the second half is how to solve this equation, to construct this hierarchical tree. I will leave it untouched. But uh, that's uh, perhaps the most interesting business. Uh, I just scan uh, what you see. Uh, the most interesting business and uh, but I don't have time um, for that. The only one thing I would like to say that these equations, solution of these equations knows about whole conductances of every band in, uh, uh, on, in every band in every band in the spectrum. Uh, they are kind of topological characterization of these conductances. And by knowing these whole conductances, I may able to construct solution without actually solving them. This is approximate solutions, but they becomes exact when Q goes to infinity. When I approach to, um, to from by rational approximants, approximants, I approach to irrational number, then uh, uh, solutions, uh, becomes almost uh, almost exact mm, approach to exact solution. So this, if I may compare it with the Heisenberg chain, and those equations are very, they're different, but uh, structurally, just a moment, uh, structurally resemble uh, Heisenberg chain. With which spin? With which spin? Yes. Uh, so uh, those equations resemble Heisenberg chain, and but in Heisenberg chain we usually are looking for thermodynamic limit when number of sides uh, on the chain goes to infinity. And analog of here it's a denominator of the of the flux, namely the ratio between period of the lattice and the potential. This is the denominator, incommensurability. Once, if, um, for example, you give me the fraction 415, I hardly solve this equation, only numerically. And this is numerical solution. But I sort of can predict the positions of uh, roots. But if this 15 goes to infinity and four goes to infinity in a proper manner, then I can uh, construct uh, the this, this solution. And that in the second part of the talk, but uh, it's maybe too much for today. Mm -hmm. And uh, having these solutions 
I can find a way through this um, uh, complexity. So this complexity is apparently becomes man manageable. Thank you, I stop now. Thank you very much, Paul. It was a uh, very, very a beautiful talk, despite maybe some minor technical problems. And you also kept us intrigued. So now I invite everybody to ask questions. And if possible, please uh, sign up in, in, in the chat just to keep the order of questions. So Karcha, you have the first the right for the first question. Pasha, my question is to you saying that this question is the equivalent to Heisenberg chain, yes, Sati? Uh, yes, uh, you, since you are very much familiar with this equation, you may see yes. similarities. So it's XZ, XZ spins, XZ chain, yes, something anisotropic. Yes, it is X, XZ chain. But which spin? Q is a standard notation for anisotropic right. exchange. And the, so, the difference between the difference between X and Z chain and here and this one is that this right side typically stays in the power N. Yes. N is a large number of sites. And right. here we deal with quantum mechanics. It's just simple equation, right? Simple equation, right? Uh, so equations are a little bit different, but still large Q play a role of uh, large number. Uh, number of degrees of freedom. It's, it's, this is analog with Heisenberg chain. So we basically want to solve this equation for large, very large Q. Okay, yes. Thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a next question from Christian. Christian Orte, please. Um, uh, so first of all, thanks for the beautiful talk. That was very, uh, very nice. So I just, so I have two, one small question and perhaps one, one uh, Real question. So the first one is about the representations. So you talked about this uh, this quantum deformation of of um, SL two and the, the polynomials, which were solutions to the ordinary differential. Right. So that exactly. And in, in the slide before, slide fifteen, you had read this differential equation, which is basically um, well, which is basically just just what is that like the casimir operator of su2 or something uh, like not, that? It's not it's not a casimir operator a casimir operator will appear if this all this alpha will be the same okay or delta delta ij in this case this operator will be simply um, laplace operator in radial coordinates uh-huh okay uh, and so the right? solutions and uh, yeah, and in this case its solutions will be what uh, spherical harmonics, right? Okay, so it should be the highest weight states for the highest weight representations for um, for SL two or SU two in this case. Yes. So um, okay. So uh, because I because this operator constructed from finite dimensional representation with a spin j, and j is the highest weight, right? I will obtain guarantee that that J solutions will be polynomials of the J's order. Sorry, solutions will be polynomials of order J, and I can count their numbers. Right. So, because instead of uh, messing up with uh, differential equation, you better think about order top and the representation. Then it's simply a matrix uh, J by J to J plus one cross to J by plus one. Uh, well, and uh, if you translate the language, solutions are polynomial in this equation. Right? This is a, I think that story has been known to still TS. And I think the year is one. Three and CTS found this ABC for uh, Hermit polynomial. But later on, the full relation to SO, SO2 came up. Okay, maybe one, one small question then. Uh, do you know if 
this quantum deformation of SL2, if you were to put the system on, uh, if you were to give it an edge, um, uh, would the edge modes also satisfy this? Uh, this, uh, is that... this, this is a very interesting question. We, we certainly thought about it, but I don't know the answer. Okay. I'm, Good. I'm hope. I, I'm hope that it is. It could be described. H mode will be also described by through that, but I don't know really. I don't know. Solution which I presented is on a torus without H. Uh -huh. I mean the, the thing that I mean there is the Landau the quantum Hall effect is is one limit, right? So, and that one has uh, interesting edge mode. Perhaps one way is taking a limit. But uh, what we as, as, I say, as I said, solution which I presented mm. is uh, it's a torus. So this side and this side and this side and this side closed up the torus. That's the situation. But uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we can cut it like, like here and see whether these miracles remain. It's not clear. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next question is from Jacopo. Jacopo, please. Yeah, uh, so hi, Paul. Thank you for the beautiful seminar. So I, I have uh, <clears throat> so uh, first question is about uh, the parameter lambda that you have you you choose lambda equal one, no? Because you were interested in okay, this particular spectrum. Yes, exactly. Yes. But uh, okay, this symmetry is a peculiarity of lambda equal one, or you know? No, the, no. Uh, I didn't show it on this slide. But uh, those equation, equations can be easily extended to lambda. I don't know, I don't remember how, but in a very, very simple way. So you put lambda somewhere here or there. It's elementary and it has been done. So lambda, for, okay, the problem is divided by two parts. This is purely algebra, right? Algebra. So it's a kind of um, rewriting and uh, it doesn't care about physics, uh, lambda, whatever lambda, uh, this, uh, the fact that it's related to, the fact that this picture is related to, to uh, the formation of SL2Q remains a fact, the, remains the same, nothing happens. But once we come to solutions of these equations, they are super sensitive to this lambda. Mm. Right, and uh, we, lambda equal one, of course, the most interesting case, and I put it already here. Okay, thank you. No, because superficially, I was thinking that if you take Q goes to infinity in that equation, basically the, the Z will be distributed according to certain function, no? Absolutely. Like root, root density okay. in the X, X, Z. And superficially, it seems that you should always find some continuous distribution. Oh, no, they not continue. Yeah, cool. It's quite remarkable how, how it emerges the spectrum from, from this. Yes, yes. And uh, I'll be actually, um, unfortunately, I, couldn't, I was not able to embed it in one talk, but, uh, but I have to say that this visual structure of uh, the butterfly, right? Something Hofstadter, being a PhD student, enjoyed, right? He saw some structure. This structure is kind of um, intuitive and aesthetic, but it's absolutely naturally embedded in these equations once you try to solve it. I didn't talk about it, but but uh, once you touch it, it looks strange. But once you touch it, you see how these uh, butterflies start to emerge and flying to infinity. Right? And in the original equation, you don't see it. Mm. Yeah. But it's gauge dependent, a different gauge uh, looks efficiently different, but as soon as you touch it. And that is the second part of the talk, and, but I didn't uh, try to. A possibility to explain it. Okay, thank you. And I have just two, another few quick comment, and it's that uh, uh, okay, in the x-axis, this spin chain now pure uh, spin chain. Uh, the, 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 there is a quantity which has uh, some 
you know, fractal structure, like it depends uh, if you parameterize the anisotropy, like Q over Q, then it depends only on denominator Q and it's the spin through the weight. So spin through the weight. Spin right. through the weight. So uh, I was, you know. Yeah, you also something. may, you, uh, since you know the subject, you may also heard about uh, so-called Takahashi Suzuki numbers, which it determine this position of strings. Yes, yes. That's exactly the strings. So it so happened, uh, since you mentioned this, allow me to clarify it. Just thank you, it's an important point. Uh, so it's a particle in magnetic field, so they have bands. The flux is rational, right? And each band has a whole conductance. Which, which is topological characteristic of um, of uh, of the band, and it's the first chern class of the band. Um, many years ago, Taulis, David Taulis, found equation for whole conductances. It's called Taulis Diophantine equations. It's equation solved in integers. That's the name of, name name of the band. That's P and Q. Solution of this equation are highly, um, it's uh, highly, it's wild, it's really wild. I have some picture to throw it, just a second. Ah, here. Uh, for example, if you take uh, this ratio, then uh, it will be 14 bands and they are the whole conductances. You see, you can't even guess them, they are pretty wild. Like their solution of these equations. Okay, so what we have found that this Takahashi Suzuki strings, known for uh, Heisenberg chain, they are exactly the whole conductances, precisely the whole conductances. I see. So this equation, which uh, obtained towers for whole conductances, are exactly the same as. Uh, uh, Takahashi Suzuki equations. It's a little bit specific, special for the audience, but since you know, I would like to mention, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, once, and uh, uh, then these solutions, solutions of these equations, which I try to draw here, they actually are Takahashi Suzuki strings. I see. Mm -hmm. But they have uh, algebra geometrical characterization as this whole conductance as this chair number. So I can know, I know them in advance and uh, that give rise uh, the, the tree. Mm -hmm. The tree is basically depict, depicting, de depiction of the Takahashi Tak strings. Takahashi strings, basically. Takahashi strings, I call it. Takahashi. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we, we still have two questions and for technical reasons, we will not accept more questions. So the first one is from Archana Mishra. Uh, hi, yeah, hi. Uh, hey. I have uh, I have a uh, question. If I have heard correctly uh, in the hierarchy tree, you mentioned that the J is related to the topology of the, to the topology, right? I'm sorry, so can you say again? I, 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 uh, I, I, I missed, uh, can you repeat this? Uh, so uh, in the hierarchical tree, the factor, the J, which determines the uh, branch of the tree, it is related to the topology, right? If I have heard correctly. It's uh, this branching of this tree. Yeah. This, this is the simplest tree for Fibonacci, but for more complicated, it's more complicated. Let me see. So you had J's on this other tree. Uh... This is, I, 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 I just, just let me come to this slide. Uh, yes, so see this uh, a little bit more complicated uh, uh, tree for different fraction and the uh, branches I call J's, right? Okay, uh, yeah. does this have any relation with the topology of the, like, does it have any relation with the John number or something? Uh -huh. Yes, exactly, exactly. This tree constructed entirely from the whole conductances of uh, um, whole conductances of uh, uh, bands. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so whole conductances 
in the physics it's called also spectral flows. The term mm -hmm. is three. You can think about this three. You probably know that in quantum Hall effect there is a concept of spectral flow. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that if I change flux a little, mm -hmm. the density of states change. But in a very particular way, uh, formulated by Strader formula and controlled by whole conductances. And this tree represents discrete version, discrete and precise version of the spectral flow. I change the flux, I approach to irrational number through rational steps. That's a discrete spectral flow. Okay. Through the tree and uh, uh, some states uh, cross move and cross uh, chemical potential according to that tree. Yeah, okay. Right? Okay. So basically yeah. playing with this equation, Tauri's equation, mm -hmm. yeah. results to the tree. But yes. the formation of this tree is from solution of that equations, uh, from, from these equations. Right? So okay. these equations knows about uh, whole conductances of each parameter. Okay, so the J value can be extracted from this equation basically, like it depends on yes. the filling. Yes, okay. yes, okay. but then algorithm, but uh, it's kind of a, playing with this equation give me a proof for, for the tree, but uh, the algorithm of constructing this tree is mm -hmm. entirely sitting in uh, whole conductances. The different thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you for a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we have the last question is from Ward. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for the nice uh, talk. Um, so this question is also related to what was asked before, but um, so is there now a simple relation between the uh, fractal dimension of the spectrum and a certain value of flux? and uh, the, the flux itself, because as I understood it from your story, um, you have these various um, these various rational approximates of some um, some irrational number, which then give these var various uh, paths. And associated to each of these paths, you have some anomalous dimension, this, this epsilon, but you have various uh, paths for a single uh, irrational flux, right? So yes. um, can the uh, fractal dimension of the spectrum for some value of the flux now be determined from these these epsilons uh, coming from the various paths or something? Is there a relation of this sort? Uh, yes. I hear you. I hear you. Um, I have a very unfortunate, uh, but unfortunate, but definite answer. Definite answer. So, first of all, about the three. I pick up, uh, so those are rational approximants to that number. So I pick up some point in the spectrum and then I can trace it back uh, to a parent. Okay, right. the me meaning of this three is if I can go along this branch and compute the band, which corresponds to this uh, sequence of bands, which corresponds to this path, these bands eventually collapse to zero, but as a power of a denominator, which differs from Q by uh, those uh, dimensions, right? right. So, the, yes. the, so the tree represents sort of topology of the spectrum and uh, that is uh, ultimate uh, um, quantitative characterization. So we won't compute them for every branch, but we didn't compute them. And we don't know how to compute them. And uh, except uh, this two, which is also numerics. And the, the, the main question which uh, remain in this business in my view is whether it's possible to compute them from this equation. Because this equation knows about the three, but we were not able to extract uh, these dimensions from these equations, only the tree. And that remain kind of uh, on um, explored territory. Right, right. 
And uh, if you ask me personally, uh, but I religiously believe in miracles, I think that uh, with some effort, uh, they could be extracted. E extracted. I see. The equations. I mean, the dimensions, but it has not been done. I see. But, but it is true then that, that there are various rational approximates to every irrational number, right? There are various paths which each have their own. Uh, yes, this, yeah. this, has been, this has been checked by, from different perspectives. It has been checked from structure of these equations. Equations tells you this. And also it has been controlled numerically and uh, with, a good, uh, with a good accuracy. So this, this tree is something which we are absolutely sure about. Uh, there is some good numerics which show that it goes along the tree. But uh, when you go along a tree, along the branches, uh, things oscillate and com computer uh, eventually give an error somewhere on the generation, on the 15th approximate. And hop, uh, then it's an error. Uh, so we don't really know. Except these two dimensions, uh, which corresponds yes. to extreme um, upmost uh, branch and the central branch, where this oscillatory problem is still there, but less, and the computer happily produce numbers. Yes. But if, if you ask me for that tree, Somewhere on the 15th uh, step, it stopped. Uh, there is a big sign problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody, for, for the questions and Paul for, for the talk. And before we all leave, I mean, for people who stayed and who can uh, turn on their cameras, uh, I, would, I would like to ask them to do so for us to register and keep it for, for future memories. So Paul, please unshare your screen for us to see more people. Just a second. Uh, uh, ah, it's unshared without my, without. Uh, oh, okay. This okay. So Valdelino, please let us know when uh, when you are ready. And once again, thank you very much for participating. Thank you. We hope to see you again next week in other seminars of the Institute. So how we are, Valdelino? Well, yeah, I think we're, it, it is done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody. By the way, may I ask for my knowledge that so how we, are those seminars uh, weekly? We're trying to make them weekly, yes.